salt and pepper. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill and I'm here today with another storytelling video for you and I thought today we would do another Fairy Dales video. How about that? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. First up, real quick, I do want to just apologize real quick for my voice. Uh, those of you who follow me on Twitter might have seen that I've been actually uh, relatively ill of late and I have finally just about gotten my voice back after like a week and a half of just sheer mind-numbing silence. I love talking, so having lost my voice entirely was it's, I don't like it. No. Mm -mm. And the other thing is that I'm filming this while uh, quite hungry. And so I thought, why not do another eating breakfast or lunch or whatever meal you're up to with Dale video. Here we are. I made myself some dippy eggs. Dippy eggs? That's not what they're really called, is it? Eggs and soldiers? Is that what they're called? I'm going to be eating. So you may as well go and grab yourself something to eat as well, so that we can eat together. Yeah. All right, well now, a lot of you have been requesting this as uh, a fairy tale suggestion. Um, it's one that I had never actually read before. So this is gonna be an interesting one for me, at the very least. This is the story of the juniper tree as collected and told by the Brothers Grimm. Now the story starts a long, long time ago at least 2,000 years, it says. So, this rich guy and his lovely wife, who is very polite and wonderful and just an all-round good person, lived together. And they were so in love. They were like, whoa, in love. But sadly, they could not have kids together. And so the wife prayed every single day for a child. One day, she was standing out in the front lawn underneath the juniper tree in the middle of winter, for some reason, cutting an apple. And while she was cutting this apple, she did a little bit of a me and cut herself on the knife that she was using. And she watched as her red, red blood dripped down and landed in the snow at the foot of this tree. And for some reason or another, this made her think about that kid that she couldn't have. And she said, oh, if only, if only I could have a child who was as white as snow and as red as blood, whatever that means. Are we talking about hair? Is that, I don't understand fully, but I'm going to choose to think like super pale with like super blood red hair. That's the only way I can reconcile that statement. And just as she said those words, she heard a rustle in the leaves of the juniper tree and thought to herself that it was definitely going to happen. She was definitely going to have a child as white as snow and as red as blood. Even though that's a super weird request still to me. And so she went inside and I guess she and the rich husband got it on because then there's a nine month, it's a possibility sequence, like in the second Twilight film where everything's just spinning around and the seasons change and she's just waiting for stuff to happen. Then during this montage, I'm not exactly sure what happens. It's not super clear, but it seems like the juniper tree is magic and she gets sick from eating its berries or something. She gets sick, that's the important part. Let's focus on that for now. By the end of the eighth month, she's telling her husband that she's probably gonna die, and if she does, she wants him to bury her under the juniper tree. And having made sure that the husband knew this and had her will written out and all that, she was pretty happy until the end of the ninth month when she had a baby who, lo and behold, was as white as snow and as red as blood. And she was so happy at the sight of this baby that she just dropped dead from happiness, I guess. And so as the very kind woman passed at the birth of her baby, the husband buried her under the juniper ju juniper the juniper just as she'd asked, the juniper tree. He got a new wife and he had a child with that wife too. And this child was a little girl. And this is the point in the story when they tell us that the child is white as snow and red as blood was a boy. Don't know why they waited so long, but okay. This second wife, this stepmother, when she looked at her own daughter, she was so full of love and, and she, she adored this child. But when she looked at her stepson, she was only full of bitterness and other bad things. 
times. And she was just really, really nasty to her stepson. She would, she would beat him up and shout at him all the time. And so whenever he came home from school, he'd just be terrified because there was nothing he could do to find any peace. So one day, the little daughter wanders up to her mum and says, Hey mum, can I have an apple? And mum says, yeah, sure, why not? Apple's good. Apple's good for you. Have an apple. And so she hmm, pulled an apple out of this big, huge chest she had. Why she kept her apples in lockdown in a gigantic chest, I don't exactly understand. But again, we're rolling with it. Ooh, knocking things over. Nothing to worry about. Out of this chest, she pulled a gorgeous looking big, shiny round red apple for her daughter. And the daughter said, but wait, mum, what if my brother wants one too? Shouldn't he have an apple? Ugh, sure, fine, whatever, but he can't have an apple until he gets home from school, can he? Wait a minute. Comes home from school, eh? The woman snatched back the apple from her daughter and said that you cannot have one until he is here to have his apple as well. And she chucked the apple back in the chest and shut it tight, just waiting. Waiting for the brother who was as white as snow and red as blood to come home. Yes, home from school. So the kid walks in after coming home from school and the mother is just standing there looking scary as anything, smiling at him a little bit evilly and saying, Would you like an apple, my son? Yeah, sure. Sure, I'll have an apple. Apple's good. Uh, yeah, I'll have an apple. And she opened up the chest to reveal all of her apple collection that she, for whatever reason, kept in a chest and said, come and reach in and get one for yourself. And then as he was reaching in, she, uh, she waited until his head was just over the edge of the gigantic chest. Then she slammed the lid shut hard as she could sending his head flying off into the apple collection, probably making them even a little bit more red. Gross. But then it's like the stepmother suddenly realizes what a terrible plan this was because now she's just murdered a kid and has a body to deal with. And so she is freaking out. She runs upstairs to her bedroom, grabs a handkerchief or a scarf, and runs back down, props the boy's body up on a chair next to the door, sticks his head onto the neck and ties this scarf around it to make sure that they couldn't that no one could see that his head was not attached to his body just ties it back on it's fine it's fine just no one touch it okay and finally she sticks one of the shining red blood covered apples into his hand and goes to the kitchen to boil some water as if nothing had happened it's fine so then marjorie walks in right because now is the time that we find out the sister's name is marjorie and she sees her brother holding an apple and not doing a single thing with it. And she wanted an apple. So she asks him if he's not going to eat it, could she eat it? And he is dead silent in response. <laughs> dead. I didn't even do that on purpose. Ha! <laughs> so she runs to her mum and says, Mum, it's really freaking me out. My brother's got this apple. I asked if I could have it because he wasn't eating it. And he didn't even respond to me. All right. So what should I do? And the mum, because she's a baddie, was like, ah, well, you see, you should go and ask him again. And if he doesn't give you the apple, right, give him a box around the ears, just, just hit it. So Marjorie does this. She goes back to her brother and she says, hey, you're not eating the apple, so could I maybe eat that apple, hey? And when he doesn't respond again, she hits him in the head. This is a great family, right? Such a good example. My word. He's been decapitated already. So when she hits him on the ear, his head falls off and she runs screaming and crying to her mom like, hey mom, I just knocked my brother's head off. I didn't even hit him that hard. And then the freaking stepmother is all flipping Skarmufasa Simba about this. And she's all like, Marjorie, what have you done? You've killed your brother. Oh, well, I'll be the good person here and I'll cover for you. We have to get rid of the body. Ugh, what a baddie. And then we find out why she was boiling all that water. It's because she already knew. She already knew that she was going to boil that kid right up into a stew. I made a rhyme. She chops his body up into little bits and pieces. She chucks him in. She's just about to add salt. But Marjorie keeps crying and crying and crying into that stew. So there's no need for salt because it's full of salty tear water. Even grosser. 
Is it even grosser? I think it is. Then the dad comes home, and it's a whole nother thing where he's just like, uh, where's my son at? She makes up this story on the fly about how he's gone to help his, his, uh, his great uncle. Yeah, he's, um, working with his great uncle up north. That's totally what's... He didn't want to say goodbye. He was like, I'm so eager to go there for at least six weeks. So he just asked me, he didn't even mention it to you. So that's fine, and you don't even need to ask any more questions about it, okay? And the rich dad's all disgruntled and stuff, and he's like, Ugh, Marjorie, would you stop crying, please? Your brother's gonna come back. He's gonna be back in, like, what, six weeks or whatever. It's fine. This stew is really nice. What did you put in this? And the dad liked the stew so much that he ate every last bit of it and threw all the bones under the table. But Marjorie, still crying the whole time because she thought she'd murdered someone, she ran up to her own bedroom and picked out her very best handkerchief, came downstairs and collected all the bones from under the table into it, tied them up and took them out to the juniper tree. So as soon as she put them down, she felt better. She stopped crying. Who knew it was that easy to get over murdering someone? Thinking you've murdered someone, I mean. And then a super weird thing happens, as if none of the rest of the story has been weird so far, where the juniper tree starts to move its branches and clap them like hands. And then at the same time, like a cloud of mist arises from the juniper tree and then the middle of the mist bursts into flames and then a bird flies out of the flames and it's like the prettiest bird ever. Like that's just, that's a pretty weird thing to happen, right? This pretty juniper mist fire bird uh, flies off to the goldsmith's house and he sits outside and he sings a song. And the song, creepy as hell, goes like this. It was my mother who murdered me, my father he ate of me, my sister Marjorie, all my bones in pieces found, and in a handkerchief she bound, and laid them under the juniper tree. Kawit, 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 I cry. Oh, what a beautiful bird am I. Those last two lines don't really provide much, but they're there. And the goldsmith, he just thought this song was so beautiful, and he ran out to the bird and he said, could you repeat that song, please? It was so wonderful, especially those last two lines. And the bird said, nah, I don't repeat myself, not unless you give me something, something. So the goldsmith gave the bird the gold chain that he'd been working on, and the bird re-sang his song and flew away with this newfound treasure. Flew away specifically to the shoemaker's house. And the bird sat outside the shoemaker's house singing his little ditty until the shoemaker came outside and said, that was such a beautiful song, sing it again. Wife, kids, come out, listen to this bird's beautiful song. Particularly pay attention to those last two lines, very meaningful those. But the bird said, nah, uh, uh, uh. I don't repeat myself unless you give me some kind of present. And so the shoemaker went inside and he got these, these beautiful red shoes that had just been made in a, in a child's size and he gave them to the bird who re-sang his song before flitting away. Then the bird flew to a milling house where there were 12 workers all chipping out and, and making a new millstone. And the bird sang his song and one by one, every single one of these uh, mill workers stopped their work to listen to the bird. And the last one, the 12th one, only caught the last two lines of the bird's song. And so he said, bird, please, I only caught the last two lines and those were magnificent. So if you could sing your whole song again, mm, I'm sorry, I don't repeat myself unless I'm given something. And so the mill workers all agree with each other that they're happy to give up their huge amount of work they've been putting into this millstone and give the millstone to the bird. What the bird could do with it, I don't know, but I, well, I do know, I do know that. Ho ho, that was a lie. You'll find out soon. And he sings the song once again and then quickly flies all the way back to the home of the juniper tree. By the time he gets there, the family is sitting down for dinner the next day and the father is just having the best day ever. He's feeling great. The mother is having the worst day. She says, no, I feel dreadful. I feel like a terrible storm is coming. Something horrible is gonna happen. I just, I feel so bad right now. And Marjorie, she's just crying into a bowl in the corner, filling it with her tears, probably for another stew. And the bird sits in the juniper tree out the front, singing his song over and over and over again and just waiting. Eventually, the father walks out the door and, and stops and listens to this song. And just as the bird finishes, it drops the gold chain down and 
it fits perfectly around the father's neck. This bird just gave me a gift for listening to its song, and it's a beautiful song. Particularly those last two lines. You guys should go out and listen. You should, you should see if you get a gift too. Marjorie stops crying into the bowl, because she really likes gifts, I guess, and she rushes outside and listens to the bird's song, and it drops those red shoes right at her feet. She puts them on and they fit perfectly, and she walks inside and says, the bird's given me a gift. Mother, you should go and, and listen to the bird as well. Mother, this entire time, has just been screaming that her veins are on fire and everything in the house feels awful and she's just, she's lying on the ground as if she were dead. And then eventually she says, I can't take it anymore. It's too horrible in this house. I need to get outside. I don't even care if it's the apocalypse out there. It's got to be better than in here because I feel like I am burning. And she rushes outside to get some fresh air and immediately, without even waiting for her to listen to his song, the bird just drops the millstone on her head. She she dies. She gets crushed by a millstone. She They drop a millstone on her head. And then the father and Marjorie come outside and they see as the bird, the beautiful bird, transforms into the brother who was as white as snow and as red as blood. And he takes their hands and none of them freak out about the dead body. And they all just go inside and have a nice meal together. This is such a weird story. If you did enjoy this video, then please do consider hitting the like button and sharing it on your favorite social media website because every little bit counts and it's so supportive and nice and good. If you haven't subscribed to my channel already, I'd be really grateful if you did. I make more storytelling videos like this, usually with uh, mythology, but sometimes with fairy tales. What's going on here? Stop that. I make storytelling videos every two weeks. I'm between. I do lots of silly nerdy stuff. So, if you'd be interested in that, hitting the subscribe button would be a great idea. I'd be very happy, I'd be very happy. I'd be very happy to have you along. If you chose to uh, join me for a little meal, let me know in the comments what you ate. And finally, one very, very important thing that you need to remember to do is crack the bottom of your dippy eggs, because otherwise the witches will sell them out to sea and use them as ships so that they can make storms. We don't want that. I just got egg on my forearm. It's a thing that just happened. <laughs>